it's uh, our greatest pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ana Elisabetta Valdano, who is a neurologist working in Modena in Italy. Uh, she received her medical degree in the Faculty of Medicine in Torino, and then uh, she completed uh, uh, her training in neurology and epilepsy at the University of La Sapienza in Rome. Uh, afterwards, she did her PhD, but also training at, at the UCL uh, Institute of Neurology in the UK. And she has uh, several uh, publications and also lots of experience in EEG fMRI. Uh, and she will talk about that today. Thank you very much, Dr. Vaughan. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a neurologist. Uh, and uh, I was doing mainly when I was at UCL, EEG fMRI. I don't know if any of you know what EEG fMRI means. Is there any of you who have experience with this technique? I don't see any face. <laughs> okay, good. So I will start. I will. Be, it will be very basic, I think. Um, uh, the idea is to describe what is this technique. And um, actually, my my aim is to to create some interest in you, so maybe you can start to do eGFMRI at your lab if you like. Okay, so um, this is my outline. So why the EG with the fMRI in epilepsy? Why we need the EG with the fMRI? Because we we might have only fMRI in some situation. Why we need the EG? Uh, I will show you that the technique and some challenges related to that. And um, well, the main part of the topic will be about application of EG fMRI in epilepsy um, and some future developments. Okay, why the EG with fMRI? Why not fMRI only? Um, I don't know if any of you is uh, confident with the uh, fMRI. So basically fMRI is a not invasive technique. Um, which has been discovered more than 30 years ago. So it's quite old technique right now and uh, is based on the bold phenomenon. Um, to try to understand what is the bold phenomenon, it's important to understand how, it, uh, how fMRI works to understand why we need to have EG with fMRI. So basically you have to imagine the um, brain circulation like in this uh, graphical representation. I know it's very simple. <laughs> Our brain is much complicated than that, but we can try to understand how, EG, how fMRI works just looking at these images. So we have two neurons here, the yellow one. So you have to imagine that these two neurons at some point start working more than the other ones, that more than the other surrounding neurons in the brain. So this means that we need to have an increase in a cerebral blood flow and the cerebral blood volume. Of course, this is needed by the neurons to work properly, okay? But the increase in oxygen is greater than the one actually the neuron extract. So there is an ex, in a, in a, in a, in amount of flow, of blood flow and oxygen, which is a much more than what usually the brain and the neurons here, the yellow one needs. It means that the uh, blood flow uh, in the vein, in the venous uh, from the cerebral brain area, which is active, will gonna have much more oxygen than the other part of the brain, okay? So this is the basis for the bold signal. So basically the bold signal is related to change in the ratio between oxyhemoglobin and the oxyhemoglobin in a part, in a, in a small part of the brain. Um, we will try to understand why is that later on. I just would like to underline that this kind of activity, so the two yellow neuron, can be in whatever you want. It can be a spontaneous activity, like for example, physiological one, like for example, what we can have during sleep. I'm I'm start thinking about I don't know physical events during sleep, like spindle or okay, K complex or whatever you want. It can be pathological activity like we record in epilepsy. So spikes, spike wave, discharges, and even seizure, okay? Um, why there is a, uh, well, actually, which is the basis of the bold phenomenon? The problem is that the oxymoglobin and the deoxymoglobin has different magnetic properties. So 
the, the oxymoglobin is paramagnetic. It means that when there is an increase in a ratio, in a ratio between oxymoglobin and deoxymoglobin, means that the oxymoglobin go down. So there is an increase in the oxymoglobin. And this go down of the oxymoglobin causes an increased signal in specific MRI sequences, which are called the EPI, are T2 star MRI sequences, which are very sensible to the change between oxymoglobin and deoxymoglobin. So the basis to have the bold uh, increase is basically this one. So a decrease in the oxymoglobin of um, uh, a specific brain regions, okay? Um, so the relationship between the neuronal activity and the bold signal is translated in this uh, curve, which is called the hemodynamic response function. So what's happened? Imagine to have uh, a external stimuli to, you apply to um, a subject. Like, for example, imagine you have a subject inside the MRI scan and you ask him to move his finger, okay, right finger. And uh, in uh, this stimuli um, in the brain uh, means that there are some neurons that are more active compared to the surrounding one. This means that there, there are going to be more increase in cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, and thus there, and the, and thus there will going to be an increase in the ratio between oxymoglobin and the oxymoglobin. So after the stimuli, the bold signal start to increase, so you can detect it with fMRI about one second after the stimulus onset, okay? And it will gonna reach the peak of uh, this increase after four to six seconds after the stimulus onset. And then it will reach again the baseline after 30 seconds. So if we see this shape, that is one we can measure use during, during a, using, sorry, fMRI, we can um, have just one important impression. So the bold signal is very slow compared to what happened in the brain is very slow because we have a peak about four to six seconds, which is quite a long, long time for the brain, okay? So this is just one thing we have to keep in mind when we talk about fMRI. The first one is that fMRI is a technique that measure indirectly the neuronal activity, and there is a technique which is very slow. So the temporal resolution is very, very slow. This is why we need, okay, and in this slide, uh, this is a very um, uh, old but a very interesting paper by Logothetis, uh, who tried to study the exact meaning of the bold signal in the brain. He used um, uh, intracranial recording from the visual cortex of uh, animal model, and uh, he um, record the bold signal, but even the local field potential and the multi-unit activity directly from the brain. And uh, what we can see here is that the bold signal is the pink one uh, correspond not only to the input, uh, which is uh, here the local field potential, but uh, especially to the um, to the um, processing of the incoming stimuli by the neuronal circuitry, which include not only excitatory neurons, but even inhibitory neurons. So once again, the bold signal is low, and the bold signal is not a direct measure of neuronal activity, but an indirect measure of neuronal activity which correspond to the processing of the stimuli by a neuronal circuitry. So not just one neuron, but different neurons, which can be excitatory and inhibitory, okay? So now we have a technique which is able to measure neuronal activity. But this, again, this technique has a very low temporal resolution. How we can improve the temporal resolution with the, of fMRI? We can improve the temporal resolution with fMRI if we use fMRI simultaneously to the EEG, okay? Because the EEG, I'm talking about the scalp EEG, is a, a technique, of course, you know them, it very well, I guess, uh, with have a high temporal resolution, it's not invasive, it's cheap, um, while fMRI, as I told you before, has a high spatial resolution, it's not invasive again, but the temporal resolution is very slow. So if we combine these two techniques together, 
we might have a technique with a high spatial and temporal resolution, and which is the aim to use this technique, is to map the indirectly, again, the neuronal activity from, of the brain. Um, this neural activity can be spontaneous, like the one we record in epilepsy, but can be even evocated by, for example, a task you ask to patients to do inside the scanner. Okay, this is the EGF MRI. So EGF MRI basically is a simultaneously recording of EG during the fMRI acquisition. Okay, so I don't know if you haven't seen uh, a map of fMRI, but usually the fMRI maps are like a fancy fMRI, a fancy map when you have different um, cluster uh, like this one. Um, which have different colors. Usually there are cold colors like this one, which correspond to uh, a deactivation, so a decrease of the bold signal, and the hot colors in green or in red or in yellow, which correspond to an activation, so an increase of the bold signal. So as I showed you before, we know and we are pretty sure that the increase in the bold signal corresponds to an increase of the neuronal activity. Okay, we can say that this increase can be uh, the results of the activity of a pool of neurons, but there is for sure an increase. What about the negative bold signal? While sometimes we observed the cold blob in the brain. Okay, trying to explain what might be the deactivation in fMRI using this uh, um, example, okay. This is a patient with uh, frontal lobe epilepsy this patient left frontal lobe epilepsy. This patient has been operated when he was a child uh, of a um, focal cortical dysplasia in the left frontal pole. Okay, you can see here, this is the uh, post-op MRI. You can see here the all related to the past, the operation he had when he was a child. But despite the, oper despite the operation, the patient's uh, still having a lot of seizure. For this reason, was candidated to stereo EG, so intracranial EG recording in Milan, in Italy. And during stereo EG, we record some typical uh, seizure of the patients who have some uh, atonic seizure without a loss of consciousness. And you can see here, this is something like a dynamic uh, um, images. You can see when, when he was stretching the arm um, and during the seizure, this arm dropped out um, suddenly without any loss of consciousness. The patients had EEG fMRI in our lab before going to Milan to have stereo EG, and we were lucky uh, to record the same seizure inside the scanner. Okay, of course, we don't have the clinical um, manifestation of the seizure because the patient was inside the scanner. We were not able to test him, but the EEG was identical. Um, compared to the one we record uh, outside the scanner and during the stereo EG. Um, so these uh, are the map of the seizure recording of the patients inside the scanner. And we can see here we have an activation in the left frontodorsal cortex and deactivation in the bilateral motor cortex, okay? And the, uh, this, um, I don't know if you can see my... Uh, uh, my, can you see my um, arrow yeah. here? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, and this is the stereo EG uh, deaf electrodes. And the, here, the red dot correspond to the most active electrodes um, recording by stereo EG. And the, here, we were lucky two electrodes were inside the activated blob, and two electrodes were inside the activated blob. So we were able to see what's really happened in stereo EG inside the deactivated blob and the deactivated blob. And these are the results. So during the seizure, there was in the activated blob, so these two red dots, a high um, frequency discharge in the gamma uh, band. But in the deactivated blob, there was a, a um, frequency, it was, it was, sorry, a discharge in the beta, in the beta frequency. And the beta frequency, so um, is the uh, inhibitory and the resting state rhythm of the uh, motor cortex. So what I would like to say here, I would like to say that the deactivation blob have a meaning uh, 
for example, in these patients, probably the deactivation were something related to the seizure semiology. Remember, he has some atonic seizure, some inhibitory activity of the motor cortex. Uh, so this kind of example tell us a couple of things. The first one is that deactivation has a meaning. So we don't, uh, we have to take care of the deactivated blob. And the second one is that the EGF MRI map is very specific of the individual we are studying, because in this case it is a typical, so it's specific of this kind of the patient's epilepsy. Okay, so we understood, I hope, what is EGFMRI, what is means activation and deactivation. And now let's go uh, to the technique and challenges. Um, usually EGFMRI is, a, is used most of the time for epilepsy. Uh, there are people who are using EGFMRI even for sleep studies. Um, is uh, in cognitive science is usually less used um, compared to task uh, to add to fMRI only. Um, when we are talking about EG fMRI um, and we need the EG fMRI when usually we need to study very uh, subtle phenomena on EG and the phasic event and event we don't know when they can appear of course. And this is uh, the, um, the epilepsy patients is uh, paradigmatic in this sense. Uh, so they, usually the uh, design we are using when we are uh, applying, when we, when we are doing an EGFMRI study is called the event-related design, which means that uh, we don't know when the event of interest appear. For this reason, we need EG. And uh, here, this is for an example of EG recorded inside the scanner. And these are some spikes you can see here with the red arrow. And basically what we do is to mark manually the event on the EG and then create the, a sort of time course, which will be involved with the hemodynamic response function to have and to, um, and to inform the fMRI data. Uh, there are a few uh, situations where you can use a block design, which is something like this one. A block design is a situation when you, um, instead of uh, um, uh, instead of marking uh, the events manually, uh, you uh, created some standard block of duration. Um, uh, when you have a, a block of activation and the block followed by, by a block of uh, uh, baseline. Um, in epilepsy, this kind of design can be used only when you have a reflex epilepsy, for example. Uh, this is a patient with a, a eyelid myoclonia with absences. Uh, I don't know if you know this kind of syndrome. It's a generalized epilepsy with uh, pathological activity like this one, which is like a, a wave discharge evocated by eye closed. In this case, you can use a block design because you can ask the patients to open the eyes and close the eyes at a specific timing. And you don't, paradoxically, you might not need to have EG because you trust to the fact that the every time he closed the eyes, he has the pathological activity on EG. I mean, this is not really correct because in my opinion, in epilepsy, you need to have EG for every kind of study you want to do. But it's just to show you that in sometimes you can apply a block design when you know exactly when the pathological activity can appear on EG. Uh, well, this is an example of technique we are using, uh, uh, sorry, um, not technique, um, uh, instrument, sorry, we are using in Modena. Um, well, basically, the most important things you need is a cap, EG cap. Uh, this is an old EG cap with 19 channels. Actually, Modena, we are using a 64 channels EG cap and our specific cap, which are compatible with the MRI scanner. So you cannot go inside the scanner with the routine EG cap. Otherwise, I think the radiologist will going to kill you because you're going to to crash the scanner, but I mean, you need a specific MRI scanner with these uh, uh, electrodes compatible with the MRI. 
Um, so the patients go inside the scanner with this cup, then there is a something as other equipment to uh, link, um, to, to connect the cup with uh, um, the laptop to record the G, which is outside the scanner, of course. Um, uh, EGF MRI is a, a technique which can be used to any kind of patients, even in children. Um, usually in children or even in adults, it's up to you. You can use some more, mm, you, you need to be more, um, to take care more to the uh, motion of the head because children can move more than adults inside the scanner. And you can use this kind of uh, pillow, which is our vacuum pillow, which fix the head inside the scanner and do um, and does not allow the the, the, the movements uh, in the, on in on the lateral plane. Um, in my experience, um, I used to scan children, um, usually uh, older than five years old and uh, I haven't had any problem with them sometimes they works better than adults I have to say and I did I did not use this kind of pillow um, we use different pillow which are much more flexible than this one which is okay very useful to keep the head fixed but can be not very comfortable for the patients inside the scanner this paper has been published by the UCL group, um, particularly by the group who works uh, with EGF MRI in children, just to show you that the problem of the movements um, is uh, a big problem, can be a big problem in children. Here, for example, this is a, um, a, this uh, histogram show you the uh, difference in the movements. So the frame wise displacement in millimeter represented the uh, millimeter uh, difference difference between one uh, fMRI imaging and the following one. And the, as you can see here, this kind of displacement is much more higher, um, significantly much more higher. It means that there is much more movements um, as longer as you have the fMRI um, session. Uh, the fMRI session can be longer um, uh, I mean, the duration of the fMRI session is absolutely up to you, depend on the clinical questions. Usually uh, we do some uh, short run uh, and we repeat this run um, different times, uh, depending on the patients, depending on the clinical question. But as you can see here, I mean, the movement problem is something you have to take care in children and even I will going to say in adult. Um, most of the problem related to acquiring the AG together with the fMRI um, are uh, artifact that fMRI can cause on EG, and the more important thing that the MRI can cause on uh, EG. So these, for example, are artifact on MRI images that can be uh, caused by the electrodes. Uh, these kind of artifacts are quite uh, very easy to be removed because you can see here, this is a T1 um, acquisition, and you can see this all here which correspond to the electrodes of the EG cup you put uh, on the patient's head. Um, this is easy to be removed because it's just uh, sufficient that you um, do a bet, so you remove the scalp um, from the um, MRI images. Much more complicated and much more uh, tricky are the artifact from the MRI on EG. Uh, this is a paper recently published by the group of Jean Gottman at, in Montreal and uh, is a uh, um, is quite clear uh, the different kind of artifact you can have on EG caused by fMRI. In the A, uh, you can see the EG recording outside the scanner, and the in B is the EG acquired inside the scanner while the fMRI is going on. It means that you cannot see absolutely nothing because there is this kind of artifact is called the gradient artifact, which is a huge, huge artifact that um, obscure all your EG trays. Uh, and this artifact is uh, um, is longer as longer is your is your fMRI um, volume. Um, 
you uh, easily can remove this artifact, uh, usually some um, tool that are um, normally included inside the EG um, fMRI instrument you uh, going to buy before starting to have uh, and to do EG fMRI in your lab, uh, specifically the EG brain where well, actually in Modena, there are different systems. In Modena, we are using a Micromed system, but you can even use a brain um, analyzer, which include the tool for removing the gradient artifact. Once you have removing the gradient artifact, you have not finished because you have to remove another artifact, with this called, which is called the ballistocardiographic artifact, which is related to the pores. Um, you can see that one here, for example. I don't. Oh, sorry, I don't know if you see my uh, arrow here, but you can see this kind of is similar to epileptic spike, and it is actually an epileptic spike because this is the clean stage. But look at this one, for example. This one is very similar to that one, but it's probably is linked well is linked to the uh, to the ECG trace, and it's basically something that. Uh, you can see here very rhythmic and that is related to the uh, pulse. So you have to remove this kind of artifact, otherwise it's difficult to understand the real spikes compared to the artifact one. Again, we are lucky because the system for acquiring EG inside fMRI has this kind of tool to be mm, used for removing this kind of artifact. Finally, when you apply your system to remove the gradient and the ballistocardiograph artifact, you have a good quality EG. I mean, is not going to be the same EG than the one acquired outside MRI scanner, but it will going to be a good quality EG. OK, this just to show you the um, pipeline we are using in Modena. So basically, we are removing the gradient artifact. We are then um, removing the pulse artifact, according to what I said you before. Then in Modena, we are using uh, un, an ICA decomposition, um, something that remove, something that help you to recognize uh, other kind of artifact, for example, physiological one, like blinking, um, just um, decomposing your EG in uh, uh, independent components. And then finally, you have to mark, to recognize and to mark the event of interest, which may be whatever you want, whatever you are study in the patients. Uh, once you have marked your events, like I showed you before, you have a regressor. Uh, again, the events can have a duration. For example, imagine to have a spike and wave discharge, you have to mark the onset and the duration of the spike wave discharge, not only the onset. And then you convolve your time course with the thermodynamic response function. And then finally, you include this information in the your fMRI analysis. Actually, in my lab, we are using SPM to analyze the fMRI data. You can use whatever. I mean, there are many, many software. Most of them are free. So you can use other kind of software. But usually, the uh, fMRI analysis is done by using a GLM approach. And then this is something like a matrix. Uh, you end it with the matrix. And this matrix contains some information, which um, include your effect of interest, like the spikes, for example example, this one, you might have a different effect of interest and include your movement, so the effect of no interest. Um, this is actually some um, innovative approach to analyze the fMRI data, basically uh, using a different approach to analyze the EG data. Um, the classical approach is to mark the event on the spike. You can, uh, but we, we all know, I mean, when we talk about a spike uh, in epilepsy, we all know that spike is not just uh, a transient event, but you can have different um, hemodynamic change related to the onset of the spikes compared to the middle ascending part of the spikes compared to the peak of the spikes or return to the baseline. And actually in this work by the um, Graham uh, Jackson group, they demonstrated that using the fMRI, you're, you can even mark the different part of the spikes. For example, you have two time here. Time one is the middle descending part of the spikes and time two is the peak of this following slow wave. 
wave. And you will gonna have something like a dynamic fMRI maps, okay? Which is very important when you really want to understand where the spikes come from. And in this example, which is limited to 17 patients, they compare the results of the fMRI map according to this method, compared to the classical method, so the one I showed you before, and to the results of um, uh, electrical source imaging. Well, actually, you can even improve your EGFMRI approach by acquiring a video videotape of the patients inside the scanner. Of course, you need a video camera. We have in modern a small video camera. We are able to put um, in the uh, scanner, in the bore, of course, it's compatible with the MRI, and we can actually record the face of the patients during the MRI scanner. And this is important for two reasons. The first one is for safety, of course, of the patients, especially when we are talking about epileptic patients. The second one is for research purpose. In this paper, for example, we uh, try to understand the bold changes related to physiological movements, because you can tell to the patients, please stay don't move, please stay with eye closed during the GFMRI, but you will always have some physiological movements, which can be blinking, which can be swallowing, which can be, I don't know, slight movements of the head, okay? And if you take care of these movements in your fMRI analysis, your fMRI analysis will go, will go, go in to be improved. And we demonstrate in this study, for example, then the GLM3 is the GLM when we include the physiological physiological movements as effect of no interest in our SPM analysis. And we demonstrated that the blob of activation were increased not only in significance, but even blob that were not seen before, where we were able to detect them using this approach. Okay, to be concrete, um, this exam is a long exam. It takes about 90 minutes for each patient because we need uh, about 30 minutes to set up the EG outside the scanner to check the impedance and so on. We usually have as I told you before, different session of fMRI acquisition. In Modena, we use two session of fMRI acquisition and the duration of this session depends on your TR. In the, la in the very old fMRI, EGFMRI study, the TR was about three seconds. So we usually have two to four session of 10 minutes each, which is quite a long time. Actually, the TR is much, much more short. In Modena, we use a TR of 1.5 seconds, but there are even TR of 1.2 or even less. And of course, the duration of the session is less long. But you have to be, um, to be aware that you need to acquire even some structural MRI. And usually at least you need a T1 three-dimensional MRI to be acquired. Then after the acquisition, you need to analyze the data, which again takes some time. We cannot calculate this time in advance because depend on the EG quality, depend on the activity on the EG, on the EG of the patients, and then you have to analyze all the stuff, including the fMRI analysis. Um, of course, there are some instruments that can help you to improve and to facilitate your um, uh, EG fMRI analysis, especially there are what there is one problem, which is to, for example, if you imagine patients with a lot, lot of spikes inside the scanner, um, is a well, it's very boring. <laughs> it's a long, it's time consuming to mark manually each spikes. So there are different systems that uh, can be developed. This one, for example, has been developed by a guy working in uh, um, close to London, and uh, they used to um, they use the events marked in the G inside the scanner to create different groups of uh, event of interest according to their amplitude. So in this case, the problem in this situation using this system you have uh, to mark the events by your own but you cannot you you for you can use this system to differentiate the the spikes and create a different group of events which can be important because sometimes patients has different kind of spikes at the same time this one is much more uh, updated, is published in 2018 by the Jean Gutman group. And this one is an automatically um, detector of spikes inside the EG, in the EG recorded inside the scanner. How it works, basically it take the, um, 
as a template, it take the EG of the, sorry, the spikes recorded in the G outside the scanner. And then for uh, something like a, a um, similarity calculation, it will going to find this uh, template in the EG recorded inside the scanner. Um, this system has been tested in 15 patients, so it's not a very huge number of uh, subject, and it, it seems to have the same or even the higher sensitivity of the classical uh, approach. So going directly to uh, clinical application, when in epilepsy, well, actually, when EGFMRI come out, the first application, and uh, probably mm, I think that uh, even now, the most important application of EGFMRI is to recognize the epileptogenic zone. So to try to help uh, the clinician to find the area to, to be removed in focal epilepsy, to be surgically removed in focal epilepsy. Um, actually, um, Usually EGFMRI is recorded with the scalp EG. So we need to be aware that the what we are recording and that we are comparing is scalp EG, not intracranial EG. Um, this is one point we need to have in mind. Um, the second point is the um, the concordance of the EGFMRI maps has been validated against uh, different things. Uh, the first study were done um, comparing the um, EGFMRI map, so the one you can see here, um, versus uh, the um, EG uh, topography, for example, or versus the results of stereo EG. Uh, this uh, paper, which was published by the group of Jean Gottman in 2012, uh, demonstrated that when we validate uh, the EGFMRI map versus the EG only, so for example, the topography of the spikes acquired outside the scanner, you will gonna have 80% of bold map concordant with the EG. And in 64%, the bold map were contributory to the clinical uh, information. What means contributory? It means that they change uh, significantly the patient's, um, the patient's path in terms of uh, um, surgical decision, for example, or, or in terms of steroid implantation. Uh, more recently, um, the EEG fMRI maps has been compared with the results of stereo G. Again, remember, we are talking about spikes, so we are talking about irritative zone, okay, which is not de definitely the same things of seizure on set zone. But with these things in mind, we can compare the results of the fMRI map with the seizure on set zone recorded by scalp EG. And this very interesting paper demonstrated that the primary um, cluster, which means the primary cluster, when you have an fMRI maps like this one, you can see easily that you have a complex map, okay, with some area of activation, some area of activation. So the primary cluster is the most significant one. It's called the, even sometimes global maxima. So it's the cluster with the maximum T value, okay? And this paper says that the um, cluster with the maximum T value has the highest probability to be the seizure on set zone when comparing with the results of stereo AG. And actually they say something more important. They say that the high T value of the primary cluster and that a large difference between the T value of the primary and the next highest cluster predicted concordance. And they created this formula which can be used to, um, to define if your cluster can gonna be with high probability decision on set zone in the patients, okay? Um, actually, however, in our experience, in my experience, for example, the global maxima is not always the, the seizure on set zone. So you have to look the map in its complexity. And this is a case just to demonstrate this stuff. This is a patient with a temporal lobe epilepsy arising from the light temporal lobe. You can see easy here, some interricular activity on the EG. This EG is the EG recorded inside the scanner. So look, the quality is not too bad. And then we have the fMRI map and the fMRI map shows some blob of activation and some blob of deactivation, okay? And the global maxima was a activated blob located here. You can see on the 3D, 3D slicer um, 
uh, right PL reconstruction. You can see here the red one corresponded to the activation, the blue one to the deactivation, and the, there is a blob in the right frontal cortex which corresponds to the global maxima. The patient was, was uh, studied with stereo G and then operated. And the, here we can see in these images, you can see the T1 and the fMRI maps overlaid on the post-op T1. And the cluster in the left temporal uh, region was included in the resection. So probably means that we're going to be this, it, it is a decision on set zone. So in this case, the global maxima do not correspond to decision on set zone. How we can improve this map? We can improve this map by applying more complicated connectivity studies. In particular, in this case, we use a DCM. DCM is an effective connectivity approach, which uh, apply to fMRI data, for example, try to understand if, within your cluster, which is probably, which is the driver. So which is the directionality of information within the cluster you observed in a complex fMRI maps. And in this case, we use this approach very easily. So we create a model of connectivity between the blobs of activation and deactivation we observed in the maps. And we tested the likelihood of this model. And we observed that the model where the trigger of the pathological activity uh, was the middle temporal cortex uh, was the most likely compared to the other four one. And this kind of approach has been replicated in 10 patients and DCM was able to reveal the trigger of the pathological activity correctly identified compared to the presumed epileptogenic zone or the resection area in 70% of the patients. So this is another approach to improve your fMRI data. So how is the real impact of EGFMRI in the pre-surgical evaluation patients? Well, actually it's not very high, unfortunately. It's not 100%, I will gonna say. I mean, in this study, they say that in 70% of the patients, your EGFMRI map changed the initial surgical plan, which is 70% is a quite high proportion, but look the, the number. So only 13 patients, which is a very low number. So it means that something more need to be done to really, um, I'm going to say, really demonstrate the utility of this technique in the pre-surgical evaluation. And probably this last paper of time, uh, recently published in the neurology by the group of Jean Gottman is one uh, of the most important one because they took something, uh, quite a huge number of people operated, so 84 patients, and they look at the EEG fMRI map, 106 EEG fMRI maps, which is not a good, is a quite a good number, and they try to understand if the EEG fMRI can have a, an impact on the outcome of the surgery, okay? All these patients have been operated, and the, how does it work? So basically, they divided the results of the EEG fMRI map according to two levels. The first thing was to uh, took the GFMRI map and considering the um, blob cluster at different threshold because I didn't talk about threshold, which is an important thing. So you have to keep in mind that the um, I mean if you use a very low threshold, you will have all your brain colored by the fMRI changes. So important to have a threshold and to have a correct threshold. So basically they divided the EGFMRI maps according to different level of confidence based on the threshold of the fMRI cluster. The highest level of confidence was that one I showed you before using the formula they discovered in a previous study. And then after that, they divided the outcome in a good outcome or poor outcome. If the fMRI map was concordant with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, was included inside the resection area in the patients as a good outcome, so highly angle class one, or poor outcome if the uh, fMRI map was uh, not included in the um, resection and the patients as a poor surgical outcome. Um, in this case, for example, this patient has two clusters of fMRI. One is here and one is uh, a little bit behind. The first one was included in the resection area. The second one was not included in the resection area. The patient here has uh, a concordant uh, map, of course, because the first one was included in the resection area. A medium confidence level because uh, the second 
second cluster was not uh, because it was uh, not corresponding to the high confidence level as shown here, but the patients as an angle of class three. Um, they try to um, clusterize the results. And what they said at the end of the paper is that the EG fMRI has a very high a negative predictive volume. So they say that using the high confidence level, all the patients uh, when in, in all the patients that were operated and the primary cluster was not removed had a bad outcome. In terms of positive predictive outcome, the EGFMRI study is not the best. I mean, uh, um, uh, probably uh, the positive predictive outcome has been influenced by uh, or can be higher using even other technique. And this study, uh, just um, to introduce you a new uh, development of EGFMRI, actually a couple of groups in the world, one at UCL and one in Calgary in Canada, uh, are able to record EGFMRI simultaneously to intracranial recording. Um, of course, they're using intracranial electrodes compatible with the uh, fMRI, uh, with the MRI scanner. And they demonstrated that the uh, intracranial EG fMRI um, is a quite uh, um, good technique to map um, the uh, irritative zone. But uh, what they said in this paper compared to the previous one is that not uh, all uh, the uh, global maxima correspond to the irritative zone and the, to the seizure on set zone. But sometimes, and in their population, um, in the majority of the patients, the closest bolt, so not the biggest one, but the second one, was the most important important to predict the seizure onset zone in these patients. Um, finally, uh, I just would like to describe you one important limits of this technique. Uh, in this paper published by the Jean, um, the Jackson group in Australia, um, they uh, provide evidence of the utility of the GFMRI in the pre-surgical evaluation, but in a majority of their patients, um, well, almost the majority of the patients haven't an EGFMRI uh, significant because they were not able to record spikes inside the EG during the fMRI acquisition. So this is a big problem. And for this reason, several attempts has been developed. Uh, so to try to obtain information even from an EG when you cannot see a real spikes um, visually. Uh, the first one has been provided by the group of Serge Volumeux in uh, Geneva, and they uh, demonstrated that they can, by using a, a correlation between the um, topographic map of the EG recording outside the scanner and the EG recording inside the scanner, you can even have uh, information even when the EG inside the scanner has no spikes. I would, um, to be simpler as possible. Basically, you have to have an AG of the patients you are recording in a GFMRI, a routine AG with spikes, of course. You create a topographic map of the spikes outside the scanner. Then you correlate this topographic map with the AG recording inside the scanner. You create a correlate, you create a time course of events that you convolve with the hemodynamic response function. At the end, you have the fMRI maps. This uh, strategy has been adopted in a very few patients um, up to now, but seems um, quite good and easy to be applied. Um, the second approach is much more novel, has been published recently in 2019. And basically, in this approach, they uh, use, like the previous one, the EG recording outside the scanner. They create something like spike template of the EG recording outside the scanner. Then they do some uh, ICA decomposition of the EG inside the scanner without mark anything of the EG inside the scanner. And they go to uh, correlate the template template of the EG inside the scan outside the scanner with the ICA of the EG recorded inside the scanner. Then they identify the epileptic component and they convolve this time course with the uh, hemodynamic response function to have the, your regressor to be included in the GLM analysis. Um, in this situation, they compare the results with the one obtaining with the uh, source, electrical source imaging. This approach has been applied 
in 14 patients with different kind of epilepsy with a quite um, confident, with quite good results, but more study needed to be done to replicate this data. And finally, one I would like to show you is that, uh, well, I mean, as I told you, EGF MRI is a quite good technique, but there's some limitation and some problems. Probably the um, to to obtain the greatest number of information at individual patients, you have to combine different techniques. And in this study, for example, they uh, try to understand the, um, uh, between a PET, EGF MRI, high density EG and MEG, which is the most informative to have uh, the localization of the seizure on set zone. And they demonstrated that in complicated patients, the EGF MRI has the higher specificity, while PET, MANG, and high density G, the higher sensitivity. But the best will be reached when more than one technique has been combined together. So just a couple of words about the other two uh, possibly uh, possi the, um, the other two um, application of EGF MRI in epilepsy. The first one is investigate the cognitive effect of interictal spikes in patients with epilepsy. I just saw you uh, an example of um, what I'm meaning, but there are many many paper on that. Most of the patient the paper in this sense has been produced in patients with self-limited epilepsy, like patients with selects. Uh, in these patients, for example, we were interested to study the EG fMRI correlates of spikes acquired in patients with uh, um, focal childhood epilepsy and to correlate the fMRI maps with uh, the um, cognitive profile of these patients. Uh, particularly in this paper, we were interested in to understand if the frequency of the spikes in these patients has an impact on the cognitive profile. And the, we observed that, that uh, um, the uh, frequency of the spikes, but not the spikes itself. So the number of spikes for time being has a positive correlation with the duration of epilepsy and the negative correlation with the age at EGFMRI at the language processing stream, which we know can be impaired in these uh, patients, uh, in this kind of patients. The third and last application of EGFMRI is to identify the epileptogenic network in generalized epilepsy. I will gonna say that uh, at the beginning of the EGFMRI era, this was one of the most uh, interesting um, um, field of application of EGFMRI because the results were very consistent across study. So during the EGFMRI, during spike and weight discharge, the EGFMRI was able to reveal the deactivation of the default boot network and activation of the subcortical structure like the thalami. Uh, you can use EGFMRI even to study very, um, a very rare epileptic condition like eye closure sensitivity. Uh, this is an example I showed you before. So we adopted a block design to demonstrate that the epileptic network, uh, um, well, the, the brain area activated by eye closure in patients with eye closure sensitivity compared to healthy control and patients with different kind of epilepsy. And finally, and this can be the last slide I would like to show you. Uh, finally, one possible new application of EGF MRI is the correlation of the bold signal with the physiological or pathological rhythms. And what to me is much more interesting is to correlate the bold change with the physiological rhythm. And I will try to show you just one example of one study we perform uh, by correlating the bold change with the alpha rhythm. You all know that alpha rhythm is a physiological rhythm recording from the occipital regions. And in terms of ball changes, the alpha rhythm has, um, is related to, a, is, is negative correlated with the activity in the, um, in the complex network, which included the occipital cortex, the frontal parietal network, and is positivity correlated with activity in the pulvinar. And we were interested to test if the ball changes in patients with the photosensitivity, why photosensitivity? Because we all know that photosensitivity involved the occipital cortex. So we were interested to, uh, interested to test if the ball changes of alpha rhythm um, in patients with the photosensitivity were 
different compared to patients without photosensitivity or patients with focal epilepsy. For the reason we analyzed the alpha rhythm of different population of patients, we demonstrate the different power of alpha rhythm in patients with photosensitivity um, compared to the other population inside and outside the scanner. And in terms of ball changes, we observed that patients with photosensitivity has a higher positive correlation of alpha power with the somatosensory cortex uh, in uh, patients in co versus control versus patients without photosensitivity but with generalized epilepsy and versus patients with focal epilepsy. So it means that even at rest, there is an increased positive correlation with alpha fluctuation in patients with photosensitivity over a complex system which included the motor system and the visual cortex. Increased positive correlation means probably a decreased inhibition, so increased excitability, which can be revealed even by analyzing physiological rhythms like the alpha rhythms. Uh, our data have been uh, then um, replicated in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy and uh, with the same findings, even in relatives of patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. So probably the bold correlate of alpha rhythms can be something like an endophenotype. So take um, messages. Uh, I, hope, um, I hope I gave you some uh, information on the uh, yeah, I know a lot of probably a possible application of EGF MRI in epilepsy. Um, EGF MRI is, uh, is probably a unique technique which uh, is able to give you, give us um, information about the generators and the networks involved in different kind of epileptic activity. Uh, most of the study have been concentrated on focal epilepsy to reveal the epileptogenic zone. Um, results are not so um, positive as probably people thought in the past. Um, EGF MRI, as I told you before, is not the perfect tool for different reasons. Um, and the most of the reason related to the complexity of the EGF MRI itself and the complexity of the analysis. And finally, prospective uh, uh, larger study are needed to uh, further validate this uh, technique uh, in epilepsy. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much for your presentation. I think we have time for some questions. I don't know if somebody would like to start. Yes, I have a question. Can I, can I go on? So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baudano, uh, for your excellent lecture. So I just uh, have a, a question about the, the bolt activation. So in all the papers uh, I have reviewed about the technique, uh, they look uh, for act, uh, positive activations and, or ne and negative activations. So um, I just have the question, if, uh, have you ever seen a case in which the negative bulk uh, um, signal, it is coupled or time locked with the spike maxima or, or sub maxima. So if I understood correctly the question, you are asking if the negative bull signal can be the global maxima? Yes. Yeah, definitely it's happen. And also it happens, well, it happens quite often. Um, I don't know if you, I mean, in the, some papers, um, uh, some papers say that uh, they don't consider the deactivation in default mode network. And um, sometimes most uh, the global maxima can be found in one of the area of the full mode network. So basically they don't consider this area and, uh, and then move to the second cluster in order of uh, statistical significance. Uh, yes, um, definitely it can happen. It can happen even outside the default mode network. And um, I have to say more, uh, if you change the timing of the hemodynamic response function, so basically if you change the time to peak, so play, if you play a little bit with the hemodynamic response function timing, you can have area that appear as deactivate, you can have a, um, you, you might have a deactivated area using the canonical hemodynamic response function, which become activated if you use another time of a dynamic response function. So my suggestion is to look the map um, at all, uh, so even the deactivated blobs. And the other suggestion is to, 
to not use straightforward thermodynamic response function. You can play with them uh, a different way. For example, the Jean Gottman group use different shape of hemodynamic response function with different peak, and they use this kind of approach for all their study. I used to use a um, different approach, which is hemodynamic response function plus temporal derivatives and dispersion derivatives, so something like a derivative of the hemodynamic response function. This helps you a little bit because there is no answer to your quest, definitive answer, a little bit to cover, to try to cover the um, variability of hemodynamic response function, which can affect your response, your results. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Raudano, for this interesting review of uh, this for me a new technique. Uh, I had I have two questions actually. Uh, the first one is uh, the matter of the resources. Do you have a uh, a special MRI scan only for this kind of purpose? So in your hospital, you use the MRI, which is used for another images. Because as I can see, this is a time consuming procedure and it should be available most of the time for the patients which are um, actually planned to, to perform EEG fMRI. So do you, do you have a special MRI only for this purpose or you use the common one? Uh, where we're using the common one, but we we are lucky. We are using a three Tesla, which is used for clinical purposes in the morning, and the two days in each week uh, is using for research purposes. And during these two days, Monday and Wednesday, you can use ex you can do experiment. You don't have the radiologist. Eh? You might yeah. do the experiment from your own, so you might need to learn how to acquire the MRI. I mean, in my lab, in my my hospital is like that. Maybe outside. Is, can be different, but we don't have any technician and a radiologist. We do, do the work for our own. But the, yes, we are using the clinical scanner, which is dedicated to research two days every week. That's that's great. And the, the second one is about the, the selection of the patients for, for the procedure. So is, is the EEG fMRI the standard part of pre-surgical evaluation in your institution or you make a, a special choice of patients who are going to perform uh, this, this procedure. So if you do you perform it to every patient who is passing through your clinic or do you perform it only in the scientific purposes or uh, as, a, as a part of the standard pre-surgical evaluation? Um, okay, uh, my wish <laughs> is to use in every patient, so, but it's not the reality. I mean, you have to have a committal ethical committee, uh, I think, as every, everywhere, and the ethical committee is driven by a specific clinical question. So, actually, my ethical committee is on drug resistant epilepsy. So I used to have EGF MRI in every patient with drug resistant epilepsy. It doesn't matter if it's generalized or focal, but must be drug resistant. If you see, for example, there are different, well, there are three groups in the world that use a lot of EGF MRI. One is in Canada, one is at UCL, one is in Australia. And the one in Canada who has probably the greatest experience in the world, they say that they use EGF MRI only in complicated cases. So in my opinion, there is no place that are using EGF MRI routinely. Okay. I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but it's like that. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your responses. No problem. Hi, uh, my name is Atsuhiko from Japan. Uh, I'm a neurosurgeon in Japan. So my question is about the arterial skin echo labeling. Uh, so as I, I'm just now working in the hospital uh, and as a neurosurgeon for especially so uh, specializing for the uh, stroke neurosurgery. And in, in my institute, uh, we um, focus in focuses on the uh, uh, stroke-related symptomatic epilepsy uh, by, uh, by evaluated by the arterial spin echo labeling. So my question is about uh, the arterial spin echo labeling. So have you ever uh, used the arterial spin echo labeling for evaluate, uh, pre-surgical evaluation for the uh, identification of 
uh, epileptogenic zone? Yeah, uh, well, um, yeah, uh, you, you mean uh, arterial speed leveling, isn't it? Yeah. So, okay, yes. ASL. Yeah, ASL is a promising technique. I think we're actually starting to acquire ASL in every epileptic patient who is doing an harness protocol in our lab. So we are acquiring experience on that. Um, the, 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 the good things compared to EGF MRI is that you have uh, less, much, much less work than uh, fMRI because you don't need to do EG analysis and you uh, don't need to, well, well, actually sometimes the maps come out from the scanner. Uh, In my opinion, um, you, I mean, my experience is that, but I'm not a great experience, but my experience is that arterial speed leveling like it is, is similar to PET. I mean, yeah, yeah. it, it yes. gives you an idea, but it's much, 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 it's, can be bigger than the actual epileptogenic zone. So it can uh, cover um, more uh, more region than the actual epileptogenic zone. But I mean, uh, yes, can help you, can help you. I, and it's much I, more easier than EGF MRI. Yes, uh, so I, I think that the uh, fundamental of the after being echo labyrinth is very similar to uh, both effect uh, as a CB, uh, the increased CB uh, to evaluate CBF and CBV. So, there is but just I, one. Sorry, sorry, interrupt uh, but, you. But, 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 but it, it, but it comes to, sometimes uh, over indicates uh, so the epileptic zone or some um, uh, how can I say so there maybe uh, it, it it may I think the A zero is very useful but uh, it it does not uh, a very weak for identification of the epileptic so my my impression is. What do you mean, the EGF MRI? Uh, yeah, so about, what... I, yeah, but I, I've never, uh, this is the first time to hear about the EGF MRI. It's very interesting uh, study, but uh, yes. So what, what I can say that there is a paper published by the UCL group a few years ago, 2008, I guess. They, for probably it's the, the last one I know, maybe there are different, but I don't know. They compare the arterial mm -hmm. speed labeling changes with the fMRI changes in patients with generalized genetic epilepsy. And well, oh. they found a quite good correlation between the two. So maybe oh, you're right. right, maybe you're right. I mean, I'm not so good experience in arterial speed labeling to, I mean, it's just, just an impression. I'm starting to do it right now in Modena, so. Thank you very much. No problem. Um uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for that great lecture. Um, I was wondering, although, although I understand they're in principle two different studies, uh, is do you know or are you aware of any uh, kind of comparison with MEG, with uh, EEG fMRI? Yeah, there is one study. I mean, well, definitely, yes. Um, there is one study uh, with uh, in patients with uh, uh, select focal epile idiopathic epilepsy, so the one I showed you before, and they compare the MEG results with the EGF MRI results. Um, actually, in uh, uh, foc in a focal epilepsy, this is, this is the one I showed by Rossi. Uh, they included MEG um, within the uh, technique used to localize the um, the epileptogenic zone. So in this study, I don't know if I can go back. I, 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 I'm wondering that this kind of crash again because my laptop sometimes make things not very good. But here, okay, they use MEG in this paper and they demonstrated that, well, it's actually quite similar to PET and high density G in terms of localizing the epileptogenic zone. And they there compare the results with the stereo G results. Um, and the, of course, the surgical outcome. So yes, there are a few, to me, a few, not too many, I have to say, that the most comparison were done with the, the uh, high density G, source reconstruction by high density G. Thank you very much. No problem. I want to thank once again, Dr. Valdano for, for being here for this, uh, providing this excellent lecture. Uh, and also thank you all, all of you, uh, because you 
took the time every Thursday to participate in the course and you worked very hard with some of the pipelines. So uh, we want to thank you once again for, for, for taking part in the course. We wish you very much success and, and probably we'll see each other again.